Hey folks, I'm Chris and I'm your Commander Mechanic. Before we get started, I wanted to ask you to please subscribe to the channel. Lately, over 90% of you that watch the channel don't hit that subscribe button, and even fewer hit the thumbs up and bell icons. If you like my brews, give us a sub. It really helps. Earlier this week on Twitch, where I stream live collaborative deck builds every Monday, we talked Hinata Dawncrown, a Jeskai legend that I was very hesitant to build because, well, we'll see. Let's take a look at this Kirin Spirit. For 4 mana, 1 blue, red, white, Hinata is a 4-4 flying trampler. Hinata also reads, spells you cast cost 1 less to cast for each target. Spells your opponent's cast cost one more to cast for each target. Talk about savings. And taxes. And a beater. Gosh, Hinata really does it all, right? But there are a lot of very, very mean ways to build Hinata. In decks that absolutely demolish your opponents and play very hard control strategies. Of course, that's not the only way to build Hinata. See, Hinata discounts your spells per target, so auras cost one less as they target on cast. So will spells you cast targeting your creatures like pump spells, leading to a strategy similar to Zada Hedron Grinder or Feather the Redeemed. But Hinata plays very interestingly with X spells. You see, spells that target X targets get discounted entirely thanks to Hinata, and that can create very degenerate play patterns. And naturally, that's what chat encouraged me to build this week. But Chris, you might be asking, don't you pay the mana then choose the targets for a spell? Well, that's a common misconception, but that's typically how we play. We pay for our spells, then declare targets, and resolve actions. But technically, you should be placing a spell on the stack with all targets, then determining the cost for the spell, then paying the mana, then resolving the spell. Say you're casting a Reality Spasm, which says tap X creatures. If your opponents have 10 creatures and you want to tap them all, you'd normally need to pay 10 blue blue, declaring how many targets you're choosing, then determining X, then paying your mana. But Hinata adds another step in there. You choose your opponent's 10 creatures, Hinata reduces the cost of the spell by 10, locking in the casting cost at just blue blue. Pretty broken, right? This leads to us being able to fill a deck that's crammed with X spells that destroy permanents like Heliod's Intervention, exile creatures like with Curse of the Swine, or burn players like with Aurelia's Fury. I wanted to be innocent and build something fair but fun, but chat twisted my arm. Let's dive into a build that's going to be... me. We started off looking at cards with multiple targets that we could reduce significantly. Relatively harmless, but good, spells like Magma Opus, with enough targets it could cost us just red-blue, while burning opponents, tapping creatures, drawing cards, and making us a 4-4 attacker. Or Soulfire Eruption, a big random burn spell that acts as impulsive draw for each target on the board, opponents and creatures, reduced down to just red-red-red or even smaller removal spells like Decoy Gambit, which can be reduced to just a single blue, and either return creatures to opponents' hands or draw us three cards at instant speed. Even relatively harmless counter spells, Negate, Arcane Denial, and Delay, are reduced to just a single mana thanks to Hinata seeing them target another spell on the stack. Believe it or not, that's the innocent part of this deck. Things go off the rails significantly when we start looking at X spells that target anything or any number of targets. March of Swirling Mist phases all creatures out for just a single blue mana. That can be used offensively to clear a path for attackers or defensively to stop an alpha strike. Disorder in the Court can be used the same way, except it makes us a boatload of clue tokens to help us keep our hands full. That leads to us casting some big, balmy spells, which synergizes with anything that makes tokens based on the mana value of what we're casting. Metallurgic Summonings, Shark Typhoon, and Dika Fractal Theorist turn these spells into creatures with power and toughness equal to greater than the number of creatures our opponents control. In Commander, this could easily be 15 or 20 without breaking a sweat. But come on, that's not degenerate, that's just good. I thought I said people would hate this deck. That's where Distorting Wake comes in. For just blue, 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 we could be returning all non-land permanents to our opponent's hands. 
It's like Cyclonic Rift, but with more stats. Harmless still, right? Well, let's add in Archaeomancer, Ardent Elementalist, or Soulfire Grandmaster. Any one of these creatures can allow us to Distorting Wake all permanents every turn once we hit 7 mana. We just have to include Archaeomancer or Ardent Elementalist as one of the targets of the Wake. Wake doesn't have the same permanent opponent's control disclaimer that Psych Rift does. We then replay the creature, returning Wake to our hands, and we can do it all over again next turn. Soulfire Grandmaster allows us to pay 4 additional mana and return the next instant or sorcery spell we cast to our hands when it resolves, again allowing us to loop the Wake every turn. Grandmaster also, importantly, gives our spells lifelink. This is amazing when we cast a Meteor Blast targeting all creatures and opponents, and gains us 4 life per target each turn. We can do this over and over again. The other cheeky little soft lock involves a card I really like but rarely play, Dismiss into Dream. This hefty 7 mana enchantment turns all your opponent's creatures into illusions. With the clause, whenever this creature becomes the target of a spell or ability, sacrifice it. Naturally, this turns everything from Icy Blast through to Gridlock into a 1 mana Wrath of God that gets through indestructible, but not hexproof. This is by far a deck that I would talk to my playgroup about before building. The opportunities to just lock people out of the game is very high, and as soon as Hinata hits play, you can stop opponents from ever having artifacts, enchantments, or creatures in play ever again. If your playgroup is alright with that, then this may be the deck for you. I personally wouldn't bring this to an open game day at an LGS. The experience of sitting down to play a game of Magic and then not being able to play at all is pretty stifling. Keep that in mind, friends. Let me know what you think about this build, linked in the description below, and let me know what you think I missed or what you would add. And, as always folks, good luck and have fun.